Everybody knows that this country is headed to hell in a handcart. This is not a fresh take. We've been saying this forever. And it's not that we're crying wolf. It's just that it keeps getting worse and we're accelerating towards that point more every week. Like we've probably got about 10 years at best to turn this thing around before there is literally nothing else we can do, which we will talk about in depth in another video soon. But I want to outline something that is somewhat instinctual, should be somewhat self-evident, but that people still tend to overlook anyways, especially within the context of political discourse and political solutions. And that is simply the way we go about solving problems, because obviously what we're doing now is not exactly working, and the frustration is always, well, we're just not doing it correctly. That wasn't real conservatism, literally identical to, well, that wasn't real communism. And what this neglects to take into account is simply the possibility that perhaps many of the presuppositions upon which our entire movement or ideology is built are just false, just plain wrong. And obviously, if your foundation is unstable, if it's incorrect, you're never gonna get anywhere. Like the house of cards will just keep collapsing the same way that if you were trying to solve an equation with incorrect or inaccurate values, it just would never compute because thinking reasonably with unreasonable or incorrect presuppositions will always lead away from the truth, obviously. It's gonna lead away from the correct solution and instead lead into confusion or incorrect answers. And I'll give you an example. Right off the bat, let's put the end caps on Suicide Watch. Right now, we are in a position where there are transnational mega corporations that have more power than the state. These corporations are run by woke oligarchs who want to and do successfully profit from the degeneration of our society. They also largely have control over our government so as to destroy small businesses, perspective or actual competition, etc. Sometimes, this is what's referred to as state capitalism or corporatism, or in other words, not true capitalism. So why does this happen in the first place? Well, because as the end cap will happily tell you, businesses have an incentive to maximize market share and profits, all that good stuff. And the logical consequence of a corporation gaining enough wealth and market share to where it's more powerful than the state is simply for it to weaponize the state by buying it so as to maintain that position of wealth and power. This is exactly what's happening now. So what's the solution? We'll just go back to the free market so it can happen again. Like, how are you even gonna do that in the first place when now the elite own your government. You're not. The natural cycle of total free market capitalism has progressed in front of our very eyes, and we are confused by this because we've been spoon-fed decades of capitalism equals good propaganda, and it is. No one's saying it's not. No one is making the argument that, like, markets are inefficient. This is simply an indictment of the idea of capitalism purely for capitalism's sake, of amoral markets, that because of man's flawed nature will always devolve into the current state. Plus, the state of technology, everything being so connected, everything being so centralized, this is just inevitable. Oh, well, monopolies can only be created by the state. Yeah, maybe that was true, like, a 150 years ago? Not anymore. We're not talking about steel and rubber anymore or whatever. Like the idea is only true in the abstract on paper. Nowadays, the only thing that could prevent a monopoly is the state if its allegiance were, you know, to small businesses and to the American people, but it isn't because it's been bought out by the elite class because there's such a huge disparity between the power of these corporations and the power of the state. And it's funny too, because anarcho-capitalists will try to appear reasonable by saying, well, we're not saying it's a perfect system. Obviously, everything has flaws. Hey, here's a flaw. Well, no, because that's not actually true capitalism. So in summary, orthodox free market theory, which makes perfect sense in theory, it's crystal clear on paper, but in practice, it turns out that things are slightly more complicated than that. Businesses get bigger than the state, then they weaponize the state to crush their competition. No more competition. Cool. Now I can become totally woke and I don't have to worry about losing money over it. The point of all of this being that many of our current problems can be traced back to our incorrect understandings of things like individualism and collectivism. And if we want to actually have a shot going forward, then we kind of have to correct those understandings. So we will go over the real truth about individualism that no one will tell you and how it was integrated into our movement to destroy us, why we were doing so well as a nation, largely in spite of individualism instead of because of it, examples of how the full cycle of liberalism looks when allowed to play out, and how this fixation on hyper-individualism destroys our personal and national identity and the country as a whole, you're definitely going to want to watch this one all the way through, so do stay tuned. Thanks for meeting me here on short notice. I have something I really wanted to talk to you about. I've been having a lot of fun with you recently, and I think you're a really great guy. But last week when you made that comment about brass instruments... And when you seem to be making excuses for Big Brass, I... I don't know. I just couldn't get it out of my head. <sighs> I'm sorry. I can't do this anymore. I have to go. Please don't text me anymore.
John Doyle in Heck Off Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off Kami. Before we get started, I have a couple things I want to say. Firstly, I feel very humbled going into the fourth year of the channel because, as you know, we just had the three year anniversary of the channel. We launched the new merchandise for it, which, by the way, is still available on the website, so get it while you can. And we hadn't done merch since the one year anniversary, but you guys wanted it, so we did it again. And you guys are buying it like crazy. Like, we're probably actually going to have to shut down and restock in about a week or so at this rate. So I've been busy with that, hence the delays. But yeah, it just made me really happy to see that because even after the whole fortified election, thing kind of took the wind out of my sails for basically the better part of the last year. The fact that you guys still like the channel and what we talk about enough to buy the merge with all the little inside jokes, that just really means a lot to me. So thank you for that. And we've actually got a handful of pretty major things planned for year number four. So I'm excited about this. But yeah, you know, watching the traffic on the merch store for the first few hours after it went live was the most optimistic I've felt since fall 2019 when I did my first real college speech. And people were protesting me and I was so excited to be being protested that I went outside of the lecture room to talk to them and then I was distracted by that so I didn't even notice people going into the room. And then when I walked back in to give my talk, the whole room was like packed. And I was like, you know what? We might actually pull this off. We just might make it. There's serious energy in this group of people and it's amazing to see it play out in the real world because numbers on a screen are one thing, but people walking around in public with, with the shirts that say democracy is cringe, I hate the antichrist, George Floyd conservative, that's what really matters. That's a tangible impact. So thank you guys again for that. Last thing I wanna say is that this is the last prerequisite video before the Satanism, Liberalism, Christianity, Conservatism series because when I was doing the outlines, I realized that a lot of time was going to have to be spent talking about the things that we're going to go over now, and I didn't want to distract too much from the title subject matter. So we've got this video, that series, maybe some classic Fall Street content. So much in store. Let us begin. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the fact that if you hear a word and that word triggers an emotional response from you, that is the result of propaganda conditioning. If you react to a word with an emotional response, that is because of propaganda. That is because these people hold focus groups, they run tests, and they analyze literally how to manipulate people's emotions to get them to support certain ideas and causes. So if you hear me say the word collectivism, for example, you might think, oh yeah, no, no, I don't, I don't agree with that. But if you go, what? This is what the fascist communist did to, this is 1984 all over again. That is because you are the unwitting victim of a psychological operation. You have my pity. It's literally just like the two minutes hate from 1984. That's the response. Totally akin, by the way, to orange man bad, madrumph. But that being said, please don't get the impression that I'm a collectivist or something. I'm not, I don't wanna share property. I want freedom, I wanna be left alone. But I also fundamentally reject this concept of individualism that we've all been sold because it's been a disaster for the human race. And I think you'll find yourself with me there if you hear me out. But first, hear me out on this, because men are being inundated with overpriced boxers designed for testosterone deficient men. One brand even going so far as to turn the waistband into a rainbow. And you know what they say, if you have a rainbow waistband, it's because you're a gay man. But here at Heck Off Kami, we demand more, more room and support where it counts. But that's not all. I want a quick release fly for a quick draw, a secret pocket in the extra wide waistband for cash or tactical necessities. I want the material to be antibacterial, anti-pilling and moisture wicking so I can stay fresh and dry all day. They have to be durable, fade resistant, shrink resistant, ultra lightweight. Finally, because I'm high maintenance, I want them to be battle tested by special forces and 30% less expensive than the competition and no woke BS. As Trump said, everything woke turns to shit. Do you want your underwear turning to shit? No, it's kind of the exact thing we're trying to avoid here. But there's only one brand that can say all that, Undertack, the only brand that is unapologetically pro-America, pro-Second Amendment, and pro-HOC. So go to getundertack.com. That's getundertack.com right now as a special introductory offer. Buy three, get one free with the offer code DOYLE. That's four pairs for the same price as two from the competition. Satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. Getundertack.com, offer code DOYLE. Very epic. All right, how do I want to do this? We're going to start with World War II. We'll jump back to the founding era. We'll tie it all together. So basically, the post-World War II intellectual trends have proven to be the final nail in the coffin, and each decade has been just an additional strike from the hammer. And because hindsight's 2020, it's easy for us now to look back and see how this was basically inevitable, but regardless, the people who lived through the two world wars saw death and destruction on an incomprehensible scale, something that you and I just couldn't understand. And so the thoughts after World War II, understandably, were, okay, how do we make sure that something like this never happens again? And basically what was decided and promoted by people like Karl Popper, who wrote a book titled The Open Society and Its Enemies, which, by the way, inspired the Open Society Foundation, which of course belongs to George Soros, just in case you still think these ideas are on our side. But the idea was basically that in order to avoid authoritarianism and in order to avoid great conflict, society must be anti-metaphysical. And metaphysics is just a fancy word for how we know things, basically. And so to be anti-metaphysical means not just that you don't know things, but that you can't know things. And we've talked about 
about this before on the channel, and I had some people saying, well, I think you mean epistemology instead of metaphysics. And I understand the confusion, but I don't mean that at all. Because epistemology deals with knowledge and justified belief. I mean that it was anti-metaphysical because it rejected outright the concepts of truth and reality, which is what metaphysics is. But anyways, and this would be more of the epistemology of it. They said that the only things that you can know are the things that you can prove empirically and that you could potentially disprove empirically as well. Uh, and this was called falsification. And with regards to the scientific method, that's cool. But when you get into what this means for society, it's pretty not cool. Because it means that the idea of the nation, the idea of culture, the idea of morality, the idea of religion, all of that exists to to restrict the progress of the open society because the good or utility of these things cannot be necessarily proven empirically. And even if it could, whether the metric is positive or negative is still subjective. And this is why he spent a lot of time critiquing the founding thinkers of Western thought, namely Plato and Aristotle, because he thought that if we can know the truth, then the truth is to be obeyed, which can potentially lead to authoritarianism and conflict. And so to achieve social progress, we have to restrict claims of truth to those which are falsifiable and practice uh, modesty with all other beliefs that don't exist under that umbrella. Those would simply be my truth instead of the truth. Because if we can eliminate the things that men care about the most, their nation, their God, their culture, etc., then maybe we can avoid mass conflict and authoritarianism since the society at that point would theoretically be open. So these guys were trying to prevent World War III by waging war purportedly on collectivism in favor of the open society. But today, what I'm asking you is this, is it really that black and white? This thinking has corrupted modern conservatism to where we think that we either exist as the individual or the collective. And the collective means 1984. We don't like that. But the truth is that there's no such thing as the individual, which is a liberal idea, by the way. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you don't have individual rights. Of course you do. And that doesn't mean that you can't live your life as you please. Of course you can. But from the moment that you are born, you are defined not as an individual, but as a son or as a daughter and then maybe a brother or a sister, an American, a mentor, whatever. At no point do you ever exist as an individual. No man is an island. You're really not that special because you rely on other people and people rely on you. And it's that interdependence and cohesion upheld through a common culture that is the foundation of a prosperous and flourishing society. Now, that being said, there's no such thing as the collective either. It's been tried before, it fails every time because it defies the natural proclivities of human nature. My point is that there's actually a balance between individualism and collectivism that is necessary to live in a stable free society. Because if you only focus on individualism, like we've been doing for the last hundred years, then there's nothing left to unify people in the society. There's no language, there's no culture, no religion, no shared value framework. The only thing that we have in common is that we have nothing in common, but it's okay because we're all individuals. And you look outside and everything is on fire. Society is totally destabilized. And then the government overcorrects for that. And that's when you get your collectivism. That's when you get your big government, which is what we're experiencing right now. Because it turns out that you can't actually tell people that to care about things like nation and culture is archaic and uneducated, that to be a somewhere, a hometown boy instead of an anywhere, a member of the laptop class is lesser than, and we'll get into that more in a second, but you can't expect a century of post-war intellectualism to conquer human nature. You just can't. So that's basically the intellectual part. Now there's the authoritarian part, which was basically, okay, how do we stop people from thinking that they get to declare something to be true? So a bunch of sociologists got together at UC Berkeley, many of them members of the Frankfurt School, which was a group of Marxist intellectuals who fled to America during World War II, and they published a work called The Authoritarian Personality, and it sought to answer two questions. Firstly, what makes a person a potential fascist? And secondly, how can we prevent people in the United States from being socialized into that mindset? So they go through a bunch of charts and interviews and correlations, and a lot of it depends upon on one of the Freudian theories of psychological development that has now just been totally discredited. The survey questions are totally biased. The work itself is tremendously flawed from the standpoint of methodology. But what's alarming is that their conclusion was that the potential fascist is an American who was raised in a hierarchical family that supports a dichotomous understanding and conception of right versus wrong and man versus woman, which means that if you were raised in a relatively normal American family, you were taught right from wrong and that men are men and women are women, congratulations, you're a potential fascist. And we can laugh about that, but the publication ends with the author saying that there's not much that can be done about the adults who manifest authoritarian personalities. And so attention must be turned to children. And social scientists must, must work to teach children values of egalitarianism and democracy, subjectivism, openness, etc., because that is the only way to prevent authoritarianism and great conflict. Sounds great, but here we are now living under increasing authoritarianism and existing basically as a tinderbox of 330 million people who feel isolated, depressed, and without purpose. But we're told that we should just ignore that because we have access to cooler and cheaper products now. 
And that's why they want your kids in public schools at younger ages and for longer amounts of time. And if you refuse, it's because you're a threat to democracy and should probably be investigated by the FBI because the iron law of propaganda is that the younger you start, the less it has to make sense. And how do you eliminate any threat to the open society, any threat to the maintaining of the amoral power vacuum, to people being able to do whatever they want? You simply eliminate conservatism because conservatism by definition, and especially within the American context, seeks to conserve a society that was happy and prosperous and moral and Christian. And it was that way because we had structure in society and liberalism in the open society will inevitably result in leftism. But it's a lot easier to get to that point if you can just make everything liberal and then capitalize on that disaster instead of trying to make the argument to conservatives as to why the total deracination of their society is good actually. So what do they do? They're already writing the history books. They're communists. And they've got 70 years of global propaganda that has taught everybody from infancy that fascism is the worst thing ever. Nazis are always the bad guys. Never mind the communists who killed tens of millions of more people, who genocided Christians, and who currently occupy your government and virtually every other institution in the country. No, no, no. It's those Nazis who don't even exist anymore. You got to be real careful with those ones. You got to be real careful. They're tricky. Those Nazis, they're tricky. And remember what we talked about in the beginning with the emotional response as a product of propaganda conditioning? They can now weaponize that against you because they can take two bullet points from fascism and say, fascism was socially conservative, just like conservatism. And you know what else it was? It was anti-communism. Just like conservatism, they're the same thing. And so they can basically channel some of that negative emotional response that they've created onto you as a conservative. That's why they call you a Nazi, because they define Nazi as simply anti-communist and not particularly a fan of gay stuff. And even now, communism is operatively defined by gay stuff, social justice more broadly speaking, but they've abandoned any legitimate efforts to advocate for the workers on behalf of just completely shilling for the establishment because they're all the useful idiots that their daddy Lenin wrote about. Like, there is a reason that these people are backed by all the mega corporations, why they can act with total impunity without having to worry about the law enforcement in this country, which serves the establishments, even tracking them. And it's because they are the establishment. They are adjacent to it. They are serving its ends. And the reason they don't realize this, the reason they still think they're against the establishment is because they are the useful idiots and they have totally abandoned material equality as a metric for their success or their progress or whatever. Now, all that defines progress is the advancement of social justice and equity. And so ironically, the only thing that made that possible in the first place was our material progress in society. These decadent and cosmopolitan and bourgeois ideas that are so practically idiotic and backwards. Inflation is through the roof. Gas prices are up. Nationwide blackouts are being predicted. People are being fired. The supply lines are destroyed. They're not even lying anymore and saying this isn't happening. They're saying this is all good, actually. Read this op-ed from an expert. All material conditions are irrelevant. Eternal social justice is all that matters. And they're too stupid to understand that a fixation on social justice or whatever is only possible in a society that, that is so materially well off that people have become bored and need to manufacture struggle in their own lives to feel a sense of purpose. I understand this because I am smarter than them. My brain contains all of their brains. That's what's funny about about nowadays. People on both the left and right think I'm extreme or something, that I'm like out of touch. And it's like, do you understand that you're the weird ones? If I time travel to any point in human history and I could talk to the people there, they'd agree with me on 99% of issues. I'm not weird. You guys are the weird ones. Everybody used to more or less think like me, talk like me, etc. You guys are taking pride in being normal in alarmingly weird times as if that's a good thing. You guys are the weird ones. And if you time traveled back to Times Square in 1945 and tried to talk to a World War II soldier, you would be unpleasantly surprised. OMG, you guys are the real Antifa, this, so much this. And he'd be like, what are you, some kind of fairy? Go take a long walk on a short pier, pal. It really is spectacular that these people can simultaneously think that we're fascists for holding identical beliefs to the generation that fought a war against fascism. But you can believe things like this when no one's ever gonna hold you accountable because you serve the ends of the regime. Speaking of being held accountable, have you accepted responsibility for the safety of yourself and your family yet? It's getting crazier out there. And because this audience is high IQ, more and more of you are choosing to exercise your Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms with an American-made, we the people holster. And these guys are more than just holsters. They're becoming something of a destination for many patriotic Americans just like yourself. Go to wethepeopleholsters.com slash Doyle. Check out their complete line of patriotic shirts. They're 100% American-made tactical gun belt with a proprietary talent buckle. They even have their own line of bacon jerky that's been flying off the shelves. Most importantly, we the people holsters are custom molded to fit your exact firearm for a quick, smooth, draw and with thousands of options to choose from plus a selection of custom printed holsters you're sure to find just the right fit for your lifestyle and Christmas it's right around the corner I know what your loved ones need they need an epic holster they need a gun glove a pistol pocket 
I can't think of any other names, but while I brainstorm, you should go to wethepeopleholsters.com slash Doyle right now and get an additional $10 off with the offer code Doyle. Every holster, a lifetime guarantee. If it's not a perfect fit, send it back, get a full refund. It's not even a big deal. Wethepeopleholsters.com slash Doyle. Wethepeopleholsters.com slash Doyle. Very epic. So we continue our journey. We just explained the post-war fixation on these abstractions, these intellectual theories about how we can solve the problem of war, which of course has existed forever. And they concluded that the concept of an enforced open society, oxymoron check was the solution. This would also be a good time to mention that all of this intellectual nonsense, all this critical theory, it's largely just the response of academia to the industrial revolution. Because to get a university education used to mean that you would study the great and founding texts of Western civilization. You would learn to cultivate virtue and discipline. You would learn to appreciate tradition and your community. But then after the industrial revolution, the fixation on material innovation shifted focus away from the liberal arts towards the contextual equivalent of what we call STEM. And over time, the only way for the liberal arts and the social sciences to compete with that innovation was to innovate for itself. But you can't simply create new founding thinkers of Western civilization. And so the innovation was just to critique everything. That was the new product, to critique every founding thinker and tradition and value upon which this country was built. So they stand on the shoulders of giants and they think that they're flying, but they've innovated nothing except for the grandest displays of narcissism and cognitive dissonance that the world has ever seen before. And this was the result. It basically reduced academia to a class of children with nothing original or value to contribute to society. They literally just want to sit around all day going, what if this happened? What if this happened? They're literally children. Mama, what if no one fought ever again forever? Mama, and then, Mama, what if everyone was from the same country? And then what if, Mama, and then what if everyone could just do whatever they wanted to do forever? And then, and Mama, and then what if because of man's flawed nature that society devolved into a perpetual state of chaos and sin that bred widespread despair and mental illness? And then, Mama, and then what if we turned... We turned everybody against the people trying to stop it by convincing everyone after we starve them of a sense of purpose or identity, Mama, that the only way for them to be happy is to maintain the open society by any means necessary. Mama, what if actual children? Wow, you really figured it out, didn't you? Here's something no one talks about anymore, but is nonetheless true. The founding fathers would be appalled to see what their country has devolved into, but not for the reasons that people so often talk about, not because of the like Department of Transportation or whatever, but because people used to raise families. They used to buy property. They used to go to church. And of course, hindsight is twenty twenty. but these concepts of limited government, states' rights, these concepts which we now pretend are our golden ticket back to when America was great, those all presuppose relativism. They presuppose individualism. They presuppose the power vacuum, right? They make no serious declaration as to how things ought to be, but instead declare that we should minimize the ability of anyone to say or enforce how things ought to be in society. And the reason that was done is because the social institutions in this country were basically taken for granted. And so it was thought that government should be structured such that it couldn't interfere with them. This is why separation of church and state is incorrectly understood. And what it was actually intended to be was a separation of church from state so that the state couldn't interfere with the church because the church in this country until somewhat recently, actually, was a more powerful institution than the government. And that was a good thing. And they wanted to keep it that way. But the problem is that framework of government is only sustainable with those social institutions in place. That's why the founders said that the constitution was written for a moral and religious people and that there's no way it would function in any other society. That is not ambiguous. They are talking about Christianity. They are talking about piety. And this is inconvenient to a lot of so-called conservatives nowadays because they just want to continue to define freedom as the freedom to pursue their preferred method of self-destruction because they're addicted to vice and they're too weak to realize or do anything about that. And this is what the libertarians get wrong because their whole concept of the NAP, the non-aggression principle, it's the brainchild of the harm principle from John Stuart Mill, one of the founding thinkers of liberalism, individualism, etc. But if you read what he actually wrote, it wasn't just that he wanted government to stay out of his business and for people to not steal his property. No, he was actually against the whole concept of social laws, even more so than institutional laws, because he recognized that they were often more powerful in terms of compelling individual behavior. So in other words, even the founding thinkers of liberalism wanted an aim moral society. They wanted the power vacuum. They wanted the abolition of social institutions because those inherently set standards as to how society should conduct itself, which if you can't tell by now is wholly unsustainable because here's what happens. Oftentimes we get locked into this false dichotomy of individualism versus collectivism. We think it's like, like this tug of war between individual and collective. And even if there's some overlap or compromise between the two, that's just like the rope not yet crossing either of the lines during the struggle. This is not the case. To reiterate, I don't like collectivism. I like unity. There's a difference. We used to have unity. Now we have collectivism. 
And unity is not what leads to collectivism. In fact, unity is the only thing that can resist collectivism because collectivism is enforced by the state, which would be impossible if the people were unified. But what actually leads to collectivism is individualism. And I will explain why right now. But just keep that in mind, that individualism properly understood is simply the preceding stage of decline before collectivism. Because collectivism does not oppose individualism. It actually requires it. Think about it. Organic unity between people occurs through family, through community, through church, through nation, etc. This is the backbone of every healthy society. Collectivism is different because the unity is enforced by the state as a response to the society destabilizing and coming apart. Because once you can strip people of all identity, everything that could have unified them, not only does the society become a tinderbox of people who have nothing in common and who don't trust each other, but once the collective identity becomes having no identity, then the herd will preserve that anti-identity by going against anybody who tries to conserve an identity through collectivism. Because that identity will go against the only thing that they have left to identify with, which is their worship of the state. That is the timeline and that's what has happened here. We went from organic unity to individualism to collectivism because it turns out that having nothing in common with anybody being the only thing everyone has in common is not a sustainable model for a society. And so collectivism and big government can be understood correctly as basically adding columns and buttresses to this whole setup to keep it from imploding on itself like a collapsing star. The system is unsustainable and they know that. And so we enter the managed decline phase of things to try to minimize the blast radius of the inevitable collapse. But the scary part is that the people managing the decline are far less intelligent and capable than the people who orchestrated the decline in the first place. So we'll see what happens, I suppose. Just a matter of time. Man versus time. Isn't that always it? Man wrestling with the reality of his own impermanence. You know, back in healthy times, man would dedicate his life to the pursuit of something greater than himself, God, family, nation, etc. That is how he conquered time. He would elevate himself towards a greater purpose to achieve this like quasi eternal state, whether that's through eternal salvation or being revered by your descendants for having achieved greatness for your people. What happens though, when you strip away all identity, how does man conquer time? How does he transcend it? He does so by pretending that it doesn't exist. He overcomes time by simply distracting himself from it with endless media and entertainment. Ask a man to tell you about himself in healthy times. He says he's a Christian. He's a father. He's a son. He's a proud citizen of whatever nation. Ask a man the same question now. He's far more likely to tell you about his favorite Netflix shows and fast food chains. That's what liberalism does. That's what individualism does. It reduces identity to that which can be commercialized. This is the concept of the graphic t-shirt. This is a new phenomenon in human history. This is what media I like. I wear it on my clothing as a flag to others who might identify with this as well. This is who I am. And this has highlighted the two types of people we have. There are two categories that people fall into now. Those who prioritize self-expression against those who prioritize self-dedication. The people who simply want to dedicate their lives to something greater than themselves against the people who will stop at nothing to be able to express themselves in any way that they like, whether it's parades, it's public sex, it's redefining gender, it's having the audacity to criticize the great literature of our civilization, to criticize their own ancestors. It's all of it. It's narcissism versus selflessness. It's left versus right. You used to raise families and buy property. Now what do you do? Now you find yourself. What does that even mean? I promise you that you're not that interesting. I just have to, I just have to like find myself, man. I need to travel. I love to travel. That's always been so off-putting to me. I love traveling too, but these people make it their whole personality and it's because it's all they have. It's not going to make you a more interesting person. It's just another totally commercialized cope for the fact that you don't have an identity anymore. And you don't even value the history or the identity of the places that you want to travel to anyways, because you can only conceptualize culture in terms of street festivals. You think culture is just food, music, clothing, and art. You have educated yourself into enlightenment, yet you cannot conceptualize that Western civilization is not the natural state of the world, that other cultures are more sophisticated than just what can be sold to you at a street festival. You have no idea idea how they view morality, friendship, hierarchy, their concepts of justice, of modesty, respect, beauty, time, none of it, because you're an idiot. You have absolutely no comprehension of the places you feel as though you just must travel to. As far as you can tell, you're just going from Six Flags Chicago to Six Flags Texas. Minuscule differences at best. You have this urge to aimlessly explore and, and walk through this maze because you think it's going to help you understand your surroundings and the tower that you could have climbed to look down at the world around you and say, this is what this is. This is the truth of this world. This is my purpose. I understand my role now. That's been taped off with a sign that says, sorry, this is outdated and problematic. We know better now. Please visit the Labyrinth gift shop for more information. And that's the thing. If they can reduce culture and identity to simply a commodity, then they can sell it to you. So now here's the really important question. What honest argument could possibly be left for liberalism? We know that leftism is ridiculous, never works, disproven theoretically, disproven practically. It is irrelevant. But the idea was, 
oh, if we can just conserve liberalism and then, then we'll be okay. And then once it became clear that liberalism just devolves as well, the more honest argument was, okay, yeah, we don't have to have a culture. We don't have to have a sovereign nation. We don't have to have a God. We don't have to have stability or security. We don't have to have a language or any shared history. But hey, all of that's going to be okay because we have consumerism. This is the land of opportunity. Is that just a nicer way of saying that this country is just an economic zone to be looted and nothing else? Yeah, but it'll all work out. Trust me. But now it's quite obvious that it hasn't worked out because now even the supply chains are totally messed up. So now what? The only honest argument left for liberalism was consumerism, but that's done now too. So what even is left? Well, but, uh, but that wasn't real liberalism. Leftism is the inevitable result of liberalism. I feel like the roof scene in The Departed. We're done with liberalism. That is the stupidest thing you could do. We just need to go back to shut the f up. This is the full cycle of liberalism. Do you not understand? Truth will always prevail, but it goes through this retarded telephone game with liberalism. Look at the sexual revolution. Sex is about creating life. Well, no, it's, it's about it feels good. Now here we are, people are developing breeding kinks. Look at feminism. Women are defined by their ability to create life. No, women can do anything men can do. Now here we are, no such thing as women, just birthing persons. Nature is healing, but at what cost? It turns out that labels actually matter because they separate things and they define things. And it turns out that if there is to be an America, then it actually has to mean something to be an American other than just this tautology of I'm an American because I say I'm an American, equally nonsensical to I'm a woman because I say I'm a woman. If everybody can be an American, then no one can be. It's literally like syndrome in The Incredibles. If everybody's American, then no one will be. It's because the word will be meaningless along with the identity. By the way, the Incredibles is actually implicitly right-wing. I could do a whole series on implicitly right-wing films. Think about it. The whole theme is that hierarchy is real and it should be used as a force for good. And the evil comes from the insecure wanting equality through force, through technology, because of their own insecurities and trauma really makes you think. Why The Incredibles is implicitly right-wing. 43-minute video essay by John Doyle. But seriously... This is the divide, militantly self-expressive versus the self-dedicating. And that's why if you look at the divide in this country, it's not like issues of economics. It's about issues of sovereignty, about morality, about identity, and about purpose. Everything else is basically a distraction. Everyone's an American, John. That's just another way of saying no one is. It's so true. Hey guys, if you like this video, leave it a thumbs up, leave it a comment, subscribe to the channel, turn on post notifications, and of course, uh, share the video with a friend. Now, you know what? I think we're gonna retire the two minute, three minute, four minute outros, at least for the time being. This is gonna be a classic 20, 30 second outro. So, Blech. gamer moment. Thank you so much for watching. Excuse me. I should say excuse me, otherwise the 7% and my mom are gonna get mad. Thank you so much for watching. May God bless America.